Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming to this session. Um, we are here to discuss digital sovereignty and global cooperation. I hope you can see, no, you can't see my screen. No, 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 my PowerPoint, my, my. There we go. Okay, thanks a lot. All right, so um, I have a couple of slides here. Um, they're done using Mentimeter, and uh, we've done that to <coughs> um, enable people who prefer to remain silent for the first few minutes of a session to actually get engaged and then get stimulated into participating. And also it allows us to interact with the people online in a, in a non, <coughs> in a, in a, in well, hopefully an inclusive way. Um, so we have about 55 minutes um, to network. Um, um, the topic that Sophie and myself decided to actually want to network about um, is this tension that we see between um, the emergent discourse, um, particularly in, in well, <coughs> Uh, but maybe I should introduce myself. I was we should say introduce maybe. ourselves. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> so um, my name is Jamal Shaheen. I'm your on-site moderator for today. Um, I am working at a couple of different universities in um, Belgium and Amsterdam. Um, the VUB, which is the Free University of Brussels, and the University of Amsterdam. And I'm also connected to the United Nations University um, in Bruges, which holds the Center for Comparative Regional Integration Studies. Um, my research field is digital sovereignty, um, and I come from this looking specifically at the European perspective right, on digital sovereignty, um, and we're moving from that towards a more global perspective. Sophie. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Sophie Hogeboom. Uh, I am a PhD student and my topic is digital sovereignty, <laughs> so we're at the right spot. Uh, today uh, we would like to make a, we were thinking about this session and we thought it would be uh, much more interesting if we would talk with each other about what digital sovereignty means uh, for you or how you interpret it, because what we keep finding in almost every research and panel that we do is the varying definitions and uh, also varying uh, ideas about the importance of it. Uh, so that's why I would like to ask you to uh, join us on Mentimeter, because then we can, uh, for those who don't or are not aware, you can just go to mentimeter.com, you don't have to log in, and you can um, uh, insert the code. Uh, it would be very appreciative. Yeah. yeah? Thanks. Go on. Thanks, Sophie. Right, so if this works, I can move. Uh, we also have Justine. Um, who is um, moderating the session from Bruges, which is where UNU Chris is based. Um, so hi, Justine, and thanks very much for being here in the morning. She says hello on the chat. Okay, yeah, so it's menti.com, and then you use the code 470361. Six one. Okay. Four seven zero three <laughs> six one six one. Okay. Everybody in? Good. Um, this is just like the warm up activity, right? Um, <laughs> We're going to put you into, well, we're going to put you into a big circle in a minute, and we'll have a conversation about the different questions we're raising. So, um, at the end of 2021, Mike. We always have to ask this in Washington, D.C. Uh, I know you're broadcasting this, but is, is there any attempt to make this uh, sound how true it is? Mm -hmm. Watch I'm afraid I it's not yeah. possible because it's the it's live streamed, right? So, <laughs> no, I would be careful. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's a good point, but okay. And I did actually just give your name out, so <laughs> that might <laughs> makes it a bit difficult. Okay, um, yeah, this is being live streamed. This is being recorded, I believe. Yes, so this is being recorded as well. So. Uh, <coughs> um, However, we can turn the mics off at a certain moment and delete the chat. Um, so, um, just 
we will capture the Mentimeter and we will use it for the reporting for the IGF. Okay. So just to get into a bit of the context, um, um, digital sovereignty has been a term that's been used S well, for 20 years in certain areas, um, and it's becoming more popular in the way it's used um, in recent years, particularly since around 2019, um, in the European context at least, where we're seeing um, use of the term in a very different way to the way it's maybe used before. Um, we're seeing that this term has a lot of different angles to it and a lot of different components to it, and we, we started off this research journey um, by actually trying to understand what was digital sovereignty. So in 2021, at uh, the end of 2021 and 2022, we um, all launched a process to actually bring people together to actually try and help us get a broader understanding of what digital sovereignty means. So we organized some webinars where we engaged with, on the one hand, technical the technical community, or representatives, not the entire technical community, representatives from the technical community, representatives from civil society, and representatives from um, the business side of things. We then organized another series of um, exercises where we talked to different national policy makers to try and get a broader understanding. And all we found was, in fact, that there's a lot of different definitions. There's a lot of non-coherence in the way that people are choosing to apply this term to their policies in the digital sphere. Um, so what we actually felt was really necessary is actually then to go from trying to define digital sovereignty to actually try and understand how and why different stakeholders use this term, right? And to try and unpack that. And as people who work at a university, this was the one thing that we wanted to try and uh, get through. Um, once you understand how and why people use the term sovereignty in cyberspace, we can then understand what the implications are for the concrete policy debates. And we've been doing some of this research over time. We've been trying to understand how this actually comes together. And today, what we wanted to do was actually reach out to the IGF community, because we hadn't done that part yet, right? And we see that within the IGF, this has, I mean, last year it was also a topic. This year, it's very much a topic. Right? It's being appearing in many different panel sessions. And we wanted to get the voices from uh, the community in this space. Right. Um, we're going to start off, I mean, we, we have input into this session as well, but we wanted to make it a conversation and not give you a lecture. Um, if you want that, you can come to Brussels and you can do my, my, my program uh <laughs> on this. Um, this is just uh, a, a for Mentimeter people. Um, where are you right now? Ah, the code. The code is four seven. Ah, do I need to do I need to repeat the code for Mentimeter? Hey, yeah. Open your devices. Oh, you can't really see it on the screen here. So uh, you need to open your device. Go to menti.com. And once you're at menti.com, the code you need is 4703. I'm looking at Berna. 4703-61-61. OK, good. So that's the first question. Oh, who's in Amsterdam? That's great. We have uh, quite a few responses already. Basically all over. 
right? I'll move to the next slide because otherwise we'll fall asleep. Our previous exercise looked at different, different groups or different stakeholders and their um, expectations in digital sovereignty. And so we thought it might be interesting to see um, what kind of classifications you give yourselves You can put other, and we didn't forget. <laughs> we wanted that kind of conversation. <laughs> I, I will not do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, excellent. So there's um, a, a lot of people in civil. Now, m I don't know, because you were talking to me before when we were talking about visions of, di of digital sovereignty, and you were also saying that there's this kind of vision towards what Mike had alluded to earlier on, um, self-sovereignty um, and the community sovereignty, right, which emerges quite a lot in the civil society field, right? So what question? Yeah. Yeah, so we'll get to that later. Um, so, uh, you want to you want to tell you want to explain the process? Sure, sure. I'll shut up for me. All right, <laughs> I'm taking over for now. Um, so, what we are uh, planning to do is we want to create groups of four. I think right now a few people have joined, so we could make a few groups of four. Um, the idea is that we made two questions that we would like for you to discuss among each other, and then afterwards we will uh, see uh, we will bring all the discussions together. Um, this I think. Right, the yeah. practicalities, and then the first question. So we, we do it question by question, right? Um, and since there are quite a few of you online, <coughs> we'll also um, organize an online room. Um, is, is it possible to organize breakout rooms online? Um, well the, it says there must be about 10 people online, so maybe two breakout rooms, please. Um, Amsterdam, Berlin. Amsterdam, Dutch speaking in the Netherlands. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's only six online? Okay, then just make one breakout room. I think that would be fine. Oh, but then you don't need a breakout no, room. Then. then they can just use the, the room. Justine will Justine moderate will online. It's online. Okay. Anyway, right now you can see the question in front of you, the first question. We'll put you in a group, and Sophie and myself will join in the groups, right? Um, and we um, want you to address this question. Yeah, yeah. One, two, three. What? Well, one, two, three, four. There's four at the back. Yeah, that's what yeah. I was thinking. We can. Yeah, just do that side and that side. There you go, like that. Is that okay? I don't know. <laughs> he wants a different perspective. <laughs> <laughs> I, d I do think we should come back because we have another question which will allow you to continue. Uh, um, but whilst I wait, in I don't know how it went in your group over there or online, Justine, but in, in my group we determined to rewrite the question. Um, and Mike is actually now sending me a list which I will put on 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 Mentimeter, but maybe we go around the other groups. I don't know. Uh, should we start online with Justine? Uh, yeah, maybe maybe first of all, I'll pass a microphone to uh, Group One. Uh, this group, gr the right wing group, um, to actually hear what what happened. Did, did is there a? Do you 
you want to report back or would one of you like to? Well, I can first start because uh, the start of the of our discussion was, I think, very interesting because the, and I'm, I would love for them to say it because otherwise I'm repeating their own words while they're here. Uh, but in the beginning, we immediately had the tension present in our group. So um, the first person who spoke uh, said, yes, there is a tension. Um, or, not I or maybe not even, a com uh, uh, or maybe that it's not even compatible. And then uh, someone else was saying, no, that's actually not, but actually I, th I think it's much better if they say it themselves, don't you think? That's what I, that's what I okay, think. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Would you like? Uh, yeah, yeah, Alexander Savnin, another free university. Uh, so uh, I was the first person uh, who was saying that there is a tension uh, because from my, my understanding of cooperation and sovereignty, cooperation uh, is what happens between equal parties somehow. Uh, and sovereignty means that there is a sovereign uh, who's uh, sovereign over something. Um, uh, it might be a state over its citizens. Uh, in some here, he, he, it might be citizen over its state, uh, uh, or it might be corporation over state or over citizens. And there is another opinion. Yes, so. Yes, um, so in response, <laughs> I said um, we should differentiate between um, the um, relationship between the sovereign and the citizen and the relationship among sovereigns in an international platform. And then I said um, sovereigns define the actors in the cooperation um, environment. And so if even, uh, yes, there's a tension but it could, uh, it is not something that would stop cooperation from uh, being realized. It's just defining who the actors are, and then there's a tension, and then you have the platform to cooperate. But in a platform like IGF, you have other actors in addition to the sovereigns, which is this with society, private sector, and um, so the discussion went on from there. So, um, without wanting to give you a word-for-word -word replay of what we discussed in our session, um, my um, proposition was that they do not have to be in tension uh, necessarily, um, as illustrated by the idea of the data spaces um, that the European Union is trying to create, where you're trying to foster cooperation while maintaining um, sovereignty also as opposed to a platform model where data, for example, is centralized and pooled, um, you can still try to create cooperation um, while protecting sovereignty. I think that. Whilst you're doing, whilst you're doing that, thank you, John. We're going to um, um, make you a co-host so you can speak. Um, would somebody from our group like to raise some of the issues that we discussed? I've put, you, I've made your thing into a, a Mentimeter. Thank you very thank much. You. Yeah, it's going to be the world's most complicated Mentimeter question. Um, we picked on our moderator and said, how in the heck can we answer a question that is so vague when it's digital cooperation? That could mean anything about anything. And so we made it more complicated by listing 13 really tough digital policy issues, international digital policy issues. And then we went back and asked the question and said, okay, for digital trade, is there a tension? For Encryption, is there a tension? For online pr privacy or data protection, for online payments, for surveillance, you'll see the whole list. But uh, we would welcome two or three more or five more suggestions. Uh, we went down this list and we did not see <coughs> any places where there's a lack of tension. I agree with, I do a lot of work on data spaces and data flows 
and I pray every night that somebody will make a data space that works so we can show that this is a solution to these problems. But for our entire list, I, I, we haven't found anyone where there isn't some collision between the country's desire to control and this need to get some kind of collaboration, cooperation, consistency. Uh, until we have global government or until we have no government and everybody's self-sovereign, this is my proposal. Rename the United Nations the United People and let us all focus on giving us all the choice we want. Sorry, I'll end my campaign now. I, I would vote for you, Mike. Thank <coughs> you, and I'll vote for you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, we will, before we go to the, the topics that you'd raised, Mike, I think we want to go to the online uh, discussions. Um, and um, uh, John, Justine first, yeah. Justine, would you like to um, summarize a bit the discussion that happened and then we'll pass over to John? Yes, part. thank you very much. I'll try my best because this is not my field, so I hope I'm not uh, misconstruing any of the interesting comments that my colleagues made. So I think the main point was that, yes, on paper, these two concepts can definitely be contradic contradicting each other, but that in a digital sense, they're not fully exclusive. And then we immediately switched to the idea that it really depends on the countries we're looking at. So we switched back to nation level rather than a uh, united people type of solution. And then we were saying that depending on whether your country is a dictatorship or not, you might have to give more power to civil societies, companies, but then it would also depend on how you regulate those tech companies. So there we also approached a lot of uh, different topics there, but perhaps then John can jump in and add a bit more to what I'm saying here. All right, thank you so much, Justine. Uh, I would like to now give the floor to John, who expressed in the chat that he wanted to share his thoughts. John, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm here. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, digital server, I think we had a nice uh, chat in our, in our break our session. And uh, digital sovereignty, uh, I think uh, it's, uh, it's more predominant in the in African countries than digital cooperation, in that uh, African countries, no, uh, the global community is okay. I think the European countries and the U.S. and others, they, um, I think that let's, let's say North America and Europe, when you talk about uh, you know human rights and all those other you know topics they discuss when they meet at the United Nations and uh, Commonwealth and all those other platforms they meet. They mostly, I think, look at embracing those uh, you know, discussions and implement them for the benefit of the people on the ground. And I think when we talk about in African countries, African countries, our leaders mostly, they're more, in, they're more for clinging on to power and that definitely will mean uh, infringement of uh, on, uh, human rights and many other things that I think are going to make them stay in power as long as they want. And even a lot, a lot of times they trick around the laws and uh, regulations to change you know, things around along the way to suit their own needs and uh, you know, you know, to champion their agenda to stay in power. So when you talk about sovereignty, sovereignty, I think it's something that they really want to so very much protect so that they have power and control over the boundaries of the country they are, countries they are ruling and uh, give the laws according to how they want. And I think I mentioned in our, in our break hour session that uh, most of the laws that we have, for instance, the Cyber Crimes Act in Zambia, the, the, the Data Protection Act in Zambia, it's, a, it's an excerpt from uh, the General Data Protection Regulation, I think it's an international you know, you know, you know, you know, document, which I think where they pick a few other things, items, and bring them and loc localize them in Zambia here, and still pick a few other lacunas, you know, draconian kind of uh, clauses, which then will make them to have more control and re regulate how you know you know you know how the people in the country should behave and conduct themselves. And most of the time, it's uh, more on uh, a design the concept to suppress the voices of the opposition and the human rights defenders and other you know 
dissidents out there who are maybe aiming at uh, pro, you know, pushing an agenda to try and question government's uh, you know, misgivings and, uh, and all that. So that's the problem that we have in, you know, we have. So the, the tension cannot completely be eradicated or you know, gotten rid of, you know, for as long as uh, our leaders, they still just come back from the UN, from AU and still sit around in their own boardrooms, cabinet meetings and make decisions which are far away from the global discussions and agenda of the global community. So that's, I think, something that um, is, uh, is disheartening somehow, in a way. So that still extends, to, I think, to, to a lot of things that we discussed, I think, in our breakfast session with my team, where Justin was a moderator. And uh, that is why the issue of uh, digital cooperation and digital, you know, digital you know, sovereignty is still going to be a bone of contention because of the sovereignty of the countries. And uh, I think that is uh, my addition to this. Thanks very much, John. Um, <clears throat> really interesting to hear about this distance, I think, that you mentioned between um, what happens at the national level and what happens at the, at the global level in these discussions and how um, on one hand, on one hand we can have um, very nice global discussions and on the other hand people have to come back and deal with the politics of their country and understand that there are certain things that need to be done that that uh, are maybe not aligned with those um, areas so um, in in ours in our group as well I think we discussed things um, uh, like um, that this question needs to be broken down into different functional areas. So this question makes no sense, in fact, uh, when you ask it like this, because it pleases everybody at every moment. Right? Everybody can either claim that they're a sovereigntist or a cooperationist, or they can even say both at the same time in a very George Orwellian kind of manner. Um, and so, so what Mike had proposed was a list of policy fields in which global cooperation or global uh, sovereign did no or digital sovereignty actually takes um, a bow. And if this works, um, you will see. I I didn't know how to do this, Mike. I apologize if this is a th this is a slider. Ooh, so okay, <laughs> okay, <laughs> good. So I was going to say, and 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 I was thinking about asking you to identify. Where are the areas that we could actually tell the UN Secretary General, okay, this should be in your report on effective multilateralism, and this should be in your report on the Global Digital Compact, right? Uh, he, he will... Well, no, I'm saying because it's unstoppable. Like, we're all... Yeah. Yeah. So... New, new, new creation. New creation. I like new. Yeah. So anyway, hopefully you can all see the, the Mentimeter. I'd invite you. There is a second page. So um, we had a prolific note taker um, in our group. So we, we had a second page where we would like to. Uh, you have a question? Yeah. Sure. I'm going to pass you the mic. Yeah. Um, uh, so re uh, listening to you and Mike, very interesting. Uh, but actually, well, uh, uh, if you start looking on uh, this question, uh, and well, you you adding UN General Secretary into into context, uh, there is another dimension of this be between, for example, uh, uh, between well, f inside uh, Five Eyes, there is no tension about surveillance, and when you step outside, uh, there will be tension, mm, something like this. Yeah, th so there are. If we are talking about UN context, there are different groups of something where uh, inside which maybe tension to other groups, may, uh, inside which may be no tension, but uh, there is a tension to other groups. So that uh, is, is it's not clearly how to uh, answer this question. It strongly depends on well your location or your op or your political opinion of your sovereign in the meaning of a country the, to this thing. So, okay, L let's now sit and break up groups and start classifying group of sovereigns. I'm joking, for sure. Uh, 
you've touched on a really interesting point there, which is uh, which will be covered tomorrow at 8.30 in the morning, if you're wanting to come along, looking at the regional dimensions of digital sovereignty, right? Or the regional dimensions of cooperation in this sphere. sphere. Um, because I think one of the things is that there are things that we can we can work on in global cooperation terms, and there are other things which do by their nature fit very much more into a regional or a specific political type of grouping. However, that's one of the concerns, that if we go too much down those routes, um, we end up, uh, and I don't want to use this word fragmentation, we end up in, in a number of different types of scenarios where different governance mechanisms are used to uh, interact with the digital media, the digital space that we well, inhabit. Okay, I, th I think you're right that there are global, regional, national, and even then subnational. We've been talking about those in our group as well. Um, I think everybody has filled in. No, uh, almost everybody has filled in the sheet. No, somebody said 10, 10, 10, I think. Yeah. And yeah, why is it that there are some people? <laughs> Please don't mess up my system. You, you. That's good. That's good. There's an ethical. Na there's an ethical nature to this research, and and you just ruined it for us. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to move. Yeah. Right. I'm going to move to the next group of uh, topics, and then I believe that's all of them. I hope I copy pasted correctly. Um, but Mike, maybe you could just say when you talk about government data policy, you're talking about publicly available data. Okay. It's it's a uh, uh, again these are these are one of these areas where when you're looking at these issue, these concepts of digital sovereignty or digital cooperation you really need to go down into the specific institutions or the specific products or the specific policy fields that we're working at and I think that the that's been echoed very clearly here in this discussion. Okay. Um. Yeah, I think that's the point that our, our colleague was trying to make, that the fact that we have our own um, belief system or our own uh, understanding of what political institutions can do for us and how they work also 
make us think about the way we think about cooperation or about sovereignty. And, and so that's why, that's why I prefaced my, my, my insight with, I've looked at the European field in digital sovereignty a lot. Where would you? Oh, we talked about that, and I said, no, Sophie, let's not do that. So well done, Sophie. Yeah. Don't violate the Yeah. Yeah. No, very clear. Um, it's now, it's now, we, we had the second question, but um, I'm sure that in three minutes, given that it took us 45 minutes to unpack the first question and go through it, I think we've done enough for today. This, we will share this. If you wish, you can uh, drop us a business card if you have one, um, or you can come and get a business card. Do you have business cards? All right, you can come and get one of my. I've already got them. Yeah, okay. You can, you can come and get a business card. Drop um, me or Sophie, uh, well, drop me an email, because my email is on my business card. Um, and then we'll send you around the PDF of this Mentimeter. Uh, and we'll continue networking, right? Because that's the point of this exercise. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Justine. Thanks very much to everybody online as well. It was very kind well, of your participation.